Uh, welcome very much to all of you. Uh, thanks for showing up at this afternoon lecture with uh, Hans-Joachim Schramm uh, from the Vienna University of Economics. I'm going to introduce you a little bit uh, after saying welcome to our people. Um, the context of this lecture is, of course, the current exhibition of TBA 21, Alan Zekuler, and Alan Zekuler's decades of, of research into the maritime industries and the crucial role that they play for our current global economic configurations and also, of course, for us uh, in the way we sustain our everyday livelihoods and in the way that we organize our material cultures and our systems of production. Um, Hans-Joachim Schramm, I have to look at my notes because it's many activities and many, many, many positions in which you have been active over the last couple of years. As I said already, you are uh, a senior lecturer at the Vienna University of Economics and Business. Uh, you are also an external uh, lecturer at the University uh, of Copenhagen in the Business School. Yep. Uh, your main focus uh, of, the res of your research is uh, in international transportation uh, and logistic management. Uh, you are basically an economist and, and a Volkswirt, as we, as we say in German. <laughs> uh, and uh, as you also told me, you, uh, your another professional background from you is like a Speditionswesen. Um, so I don't even know what the English word for that is. Freight forwarding. <laughs> Freight forwarding, yeah. Um, yeah, the lecture today will, uh, I, I will give a very short introduction uh, into what we mean with the Oceanic Age, and then as soon as possible, I'm gonna give the word to you and you're gonna lead us through uh, a discussion of uh, the cargo container itself, the development of the shipping industries, and also uh, like the ships themselves, and also the global uh, trade routes which we are currently facing. Um, so, Alan Zekula Okeanos basically suggests uh, that we need a more profound understanding of the maritime space and the maritime industries in order to understand both our current situation, but also uh, many of the challenges that we are facing at the moment. Um, we are facing an ecological crisis, we are facing a reconfiguration of, of, of our economies uh, and social struggles that are organized around labor and production and possibilities to make a living. And um, so the Oceanic Age, basically, it's we, we also proposed it in our little uh, introductionary text, is a configuration between global seaborne trade, imperialism, colonialism, uh, and, and, and profit margins, the possibility to make immense amounts of wealth that started kind of around the 15th century. The in the 15th century, uh, due to innovations in the way ships were built, due to innovations uh, in the possibilities of navigating through the maritime space, uh, most importantly, of course, the compass, um, it was suddenly able to leave uh, the home shores and to travel uh, with, with, this with the trading ships and also with the military ships uh, to other continents. Uh, and specifically at the time, the interest was uh, focused towards the Far East. This is like, uh, that's also the reason, of course, as you all know, why the Indians are called Indians, because the basic strategy of Columbus was to go to India. Uh, and so the Portuguese have been the first that actually uh, constructed a very complex system of ports and trading posts all around the African coast, going towards the Far East and then being able to sustain uh, this kind of trading network which brought them as, as an empire and specifically, of course, the, the merchants and, and the emperors behind this trade system, uh, an immense amount of wealth. The same goes then for the Spanish, for the Dutch. Uh, the biggest maritime-based empire was, of course, the British uh, uh, ruling the 19th century. And uh, there is a phrase by Alan Sekuler, uh, I think he's kind of quoting a more uh, well-known phrase from an English uh, historian of seafaring, uh, and it's like, whoever rules the seas ruins the world. So I think this is, this is the basic context of, of what this lecture is going to be about. Um, after the lecture, you're very much invited to engage in the Q&A. Like I think there will be many questions that will come up, and you're very much invited to um, 
engage and, and, and also further the discussion. Thank you very much. I think that's enough from my side, and uh, I, th I think we get started. Well, maybe one thing, uh, just which, uh, what we see on this image uh, actually is uh, a Portuguese ship arriving at a Japanese coast in the 15th century. So uh, the Oceanic Age has not only gravely transformed and shaped the history of the European nations and the European countries, but of course of uh, nations and people all over the world as it does at the moment right now. But, okay, that's, I think that's enough, and I give the word to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for this introduction, nice introduction. Actually, I will talk, do not talk too much about the late medieval ages, so I will jump in a little bit later. Um, but before I start, um, maybe some declaration why I come to Alan Secula and to this work, and actually what is what I'm most impressed about the work is especially the left one here, the forgotten space. I don't know whether you have seen the film, but it's really worth having, having it once, at, or at least once seen. If not the original in English, then the German, because um, in the German, uh, Nina Hagen is the off tone, yeah? So it is very, very special. Um, I do not want to talk too much about the forgotten space, also maybe not too much about Fish Story, it's a book, a very popular book of Alan Secula, but actually what he maybe didn't say somehow, and uh, I want to give a little bit of an update yeah, to this, because um, the forgotten space was made uh, 2010, the Fish Story book, actually most of the pictures you will see also, I have some couple of them in the slides. <laughs> um, they are from the mid '90s. Mid '90s was a, I would say, total different time when it comes on modern shipping or uh, modern maritime shipping, um, because in between there was a lot of change. But anyway, I'm fully behind all these things Alan Sikula says, because he is an historian, and he is really quite exact always about. So being in the practitioner halfway, I always highly appreciate what he what he says, yeah, and it's everything actually all right, yeah. Okay, sometimes times changes, we will see a little bit. First, you said it already, um, there is Adam Smith. Adam Smith is uh, several times um, cited by Alan Sekula because he is one of these most important guys when it comes on economists. When I started as an economist studying, I studied at Humboldt University in Eastern Berlin. It was shortly after the reunification of um, Germany, and it was quite fun to see some Marxism, Leninism teachers having in when it came on, on lectures. Sometimes we had also Western teachers, and especially Adam Smith was one of those big figures, actually, every economist should know. Yeah. From uh, Adam Smith, we could learn a lot. He was the first who made this big book, that's the Wealth of Nations. It's one of these most important books of him. The other is about moral sentiments. Yes, the moral sentiments is the other one. And um, in the Wealth of Nations, a lot of things were said first time. So he made, for example, this example about the needle and the pin, so how to make production efficient. Yeah, that's um, well, later on it was reinvented more or less. It was about also about free trade. He made free trade as a principle, actually. Uh, in our times, we can see there is a guy at the US yeah, called T, starting with T. He does not like to do this. but. Okay, free trade is better. Everybody is better off with free trade. Yeah? So he started to, to um, say this. He also talked about stock exchanges, about risk, about finance, a lot of things. Yeah? Book, if you take this book, some reprint, it's about three centimeters thick. Yeah? And uh, there's a lots of ideas later on were maybe more detailed, more modeled, yeah? because this always was oral reasoning in his book. There are no no fancy uh, formulas in it, no mathematics. Yeah. As a student, for example, I got one of the first guys I read 
about who read a brute, uh, wrote about um, mathematical formulas was hoteling. I don't know whether you know this uh, example. A hoteling is the guy who stipulated that we have and we have an, a beach and we have two ice cream uh, sellers. They will be one to each other yeah, in order to get the best of the market. Yeah, that's the same, for example, for political parties. If we have a political parties too. Um, those like, uh, for example, SPÖ, the Socialist Party, and the ÖVP, yeah, the Christdemocrat Christ parties, they are always very close to each other. Yeah? So therefore it's, it's possible to have a big coalition. Yeah? That's the same, actually, the same principle, just economics. Yeah? Um, one other thing what uh, Action Alice Akula said about and uh, quoted in uh, Adam Smith was about his, um, how, how he talked about the sea. Actually, he was Scottish and lived really at a seaside, so he know, knew what sea life means and what trade and maritime transport means. So he was always about, when he referred to risk, he always referred to risk of the sea. Yeah? So perils of the sea, the risk of the sea. And actually at that time it was not so sure that you get home if you started your journey across the sea. Yeah? So sometimes it's a little bit rough weather and then yeah, you have a ship wrecking here. This, by the way, is a picture of uh, William Turner, one of those um, great artists, painters who made a lot of such uh, paintings in this respect. Yeah. Another aspect of Alan Sekula is also, he talks about the sea as a room, a space for economics or resources. Yeah. We are living on land, we are not, not living on sea. Only a few percentage of people in the world are living on sea or very close to the sea, and even maybe beyond sea level, almost, yeah? If you think about some Pacific islands. But he also, in especially his story, he, um, he reminds us that sea is actually a space which is international, multinational, outside of the territories, which is exploited to a high extent. That's one about fishery, that's also about raw resources, we get a lot of raw oil uh, from the seas, yeah. And he resembled us, he resembled and, um, about Jules Verne and about especially 20,000 leagues under the sea, where this Captain Nemo is maybe one of the first who really realized that the sea is very important. Yeah. And that's actually also one aspect of the Oceanic Age, yeah, especially, because it's not only about, uh, yes, we have some seafarers and it's adventurous, but it's actually, it's an industry. Yeah. Today, for example, when we think about food stuff, yeah, and especially, especially um, feeding all our growing population, more and more and more, people think about, okay, we have to include also the resources from sea. Yeah. So it's not only about fish, but it's also about uh, other stuff from there. And therefore, uh, we see that it's really exploitable. Yeah? And it's somehow a problem that it's not a territory, it's just international sea. Yeah? So after 12 miles or 50 miles outside the shoreline, it's international. Everybody can do what he or she wants. And of course, oops, uh, um, Jules Verne was not only fiction, because in the um, 19th century a lot of progress um, came up, and especially when it comes on trade. There was one, one striking year, it was 1871, around, where the first steamships came to into um, service. Before we had sailing ships, here you see a ship which is combined, that's the Great Eastern, there were two ships, Great Eastern, Great Western, were the largest ships by far um, at that time. By the way, they were not very economical, profitable. Yeah, so they had a really short life. They were too much. Yeah, it was too much at that time um, in the 19th century. And you see here the combinations still. So actually, three combinations. So they had uh, they had a st uh, steam steam as well as sails. 
and they could transport about 4,000 people. Yeah? But was no great success. Anyway, some of those um, some of those visions by Jules Verne got through. Yeah, actually, he was really visionary. I have also already visited his home at Amiens, and it's uh, really worth a visit there. Yeah, where you when you are just in the neighborhood of Amiens, then you should go there. Yeah, because you can see wha- how he lived and so on. So he lived a little bit like a steampunk, indeed. Yes. Yeah, so the modern, when we just uh, coined it a little bit mod- more modern words, yeah. Anyway, um, this is one of the first of the series of pictures of Alan Sekula. This is the, uh, what was it? It was the, uh, yes, Global Mariner. It's from the Ship of Fools series. And this is a quite typical ship from after Second World War until maybe the 70s, 80s. Sh- such ships are still in service but they are not the order. But in the 50s and 60s until 70s and 80s, these were actually the workhorses of trade. Yeah. Um, actually, everything you had to pick and pack and everything uh, you have to load and unload the ship. And it took about six days to unload the ship and to load, to reload the ship. Yeah was quite efficient because you used every space in the ship, but it was very laborious. Yeah. Anyway, there was uh, a need for an invention, and uh, we have to uh, talk about. You see on the left-hand side, you see that's um, Malcolm McLean. Malcolm McLean was a freight forwarder, a trucking company. He founded a trucking company. And already in the 30s, he had a dream. Yeah, not not only Martin Luther King had dreams. Yeah. He also. Um, Malcolm McLean was a trucker, and he transported, I think, it was tobacco from the inner land to the seashore. And he always had to wait a long time with his truck there until getting unloaded. And waiting a long time there, he had a dream. What if? What if? we could remove my cargo within seconds from my truck. Yeah? And he, well, he could not realize this dream a long time, so there was the Second World War in between, and, but he was got very, um, very profitable, he got a very profitable business, or run, ran a very profitable business called McLean Trucking. He was one of the best, the biggest trucking companies in LCL, LTL service, which means full trucks or only part loads of trucks. And after Second World War in 1956, he took the chance to buy some ships, old ships from Second World War. And one of them was the Idle X. Idle X was a um, tramp ship from Second World War. I think it was a tanker even. And he just put on the deck some more steel blades and then he could put on 56 TUs, 56 containers. Yeah. Yes, and then it started. Um, on the right-hand side, you see a book that's from Mark Levison. That's one of those books who came out about five to ten years ago when the container got 50 years old. Now the container is 60 years old, but the books are still available. Yeah. So that's, this is really a um, must read, actually, if you want to uh, know more about containerism. Yes, what is the box? Um, this is a box here. This is a technical, technical plan of a box. You can see here um, a TU 20 foot equivalent unit. That's actually the unit we are counting in uh, containerization. Um, that's a box initially length of 20 foot of about a wide of 80 foot, 8 foot, and a height of 8 foot. Um, Finally, this measure is quite inefficient, in, as especially for us Europeans, quite inefficient. But it was that time the maximum dimension you could drive with a truck in the US. Yeah? 
And therefore, the US was the first where they used these containers. And um, yes, there was in the 60s, there was, an, there was an, uh, some uh, meeting, a big meeting at, at Hamburg about how to standardize this all over the world. And the result was um, the big box. The box gets a US American and not a European. Yeah. Anyway, um, the box is very efficient. You see here on the left-hand side categories of uh, goods. That's the category, statistics categories of goods. You can start with zero, anything you can eat, and you end with uh, nothing you can eat. Uh, Mechangelist manufacturers, so more so clothes and toys and cameras and such alike and footwear. And on the right-hand side, you can see how much is the container used for those stuff. Yeah. So when it's very right, almost everything is in the container. It's on the very left, almost nothing is in the container. But if you look on the, uh, on the um, goods which are actually not in the container, that's are, for example, grain, iron ore, coal, cement, and vehicles, and also all sorts of chemicals, these are so-called bulk goods. So you get most of them, get you get in a full shipload, yeah? so several thousand of tons. It might be possible that you put it in a container, but it's not efficient, actually. Especially when we, for example, look on the vehicles. So all sorts of cars are normally not put in the container because you, well, you use up more space and it's more costly than using special car, uh, cargo ships yeah? for this respect. Yeah, so how, how the container evolved, um, normally, um, normally people show then, okay, how much turnover of TUs was done or how many ships is, are there. I, I really like to show more about the containers, yeah? not about the ships, not about the companies, not about the profits, but about the containers. These are the population of maritime containers by length in TU from 1970 to 2015. Maybe some words about the time before. So from 1956 to 1970, the early ages of containerization, actually you don't get any data. It's only a few. So as I said, Idolix had about 50, 60 TUs. And there's another company that's called Mats Navigation who started in the US West Coast Hawaii trade, also with small containers, so it's almost negligible to today. Today we have about 32, 34 million containers, yeah? and thinking about a couple of 200s is nothing. Yeah? Um, a first big, uh, big um, work of the containers, uh, use of the containers was actually Korean War, and later on, later on Vietnam War. So the militaries used it. And then in the 70s, actually, it starts really about, you get statistics also, yeah. So in the 1970s, uh, um, there was a, there's one, one um, journal, Trade Press Journal was, uh, was uh, started, started publishing, that's called Containerization International, which is now part of Lloyd's List, and next month it will be renamed. So over the whole distance, this, this uh, um, journal was there and always delivered data. So most of the data is actually from uh, Containerization International. So what you can see is here, there's a ver very small start. And then you can see until so maybe the 80s, we have records. Then there is a period without records. Um, I'm sorry, there were no records. I searched a long time and I didn't find anything. But containers are also not actually recorded. Yeah? You, have, you have actually have some registration number, but this registration number, you can see on the doors, is just used for identification purposes, but there is no register, like for cars or vehicles or aircrafts. There is nothing about this. So that a lot of things here, a lot of this data is actually subject to some estimation. Anyway, we, what we can see in the 90s, they got interest about how to, well, to calculate, again, containers. And then you can see there's a huge growth. Yeah? So from the 90s going on, it's a huge growth. And what you also can see here, 
So the upper curve is 40 foot, the down, the mid curve is 20 foot, and the low, the very down low number is 45 or others. So actually we have two dominant sizes in maritime, one TU 20 foot long and a double feature, yeah, uh, 40 foot. Yeah. <coughs> From where do containers come? From China. Well, it's, um, yeah, it's a fact. Yeah. So the red line is the production of China. You can see also here from the 90s, they're starting from the 90s by, uh, with production. You see there is a steep um, grace, uh, so um, increase for production per annum, actually is this, production per annum. You see some bumps down, so this was around 2000, we had a crisis. It was about two, uh, 2003, five r around, another crisis, another big crisis, yeah. In the big crisis, you see here about three million containers were not built. And this was just, well, the reason why it were happened was that uh, the Chinese manufacturer just closed their doors. They had no demand. And when they want to start again, they had to search for their workers because all the workers disappeared. Yeah? You know, the system in, in China is when you are working these coastline regions, actually you are coming from hinterland. Yeah? And you are only allowed to be in these coastline regions when you have some work. If you don't have work, you have to leave. Because you are not citizen of those uh, regions, yeah? coastline regions. Um, on the other side, you see in the 90s and the 80s, you see also there is one, one area uh, was the leader, that's other Asia. Um, all this was actually was Taiwan, so some other sort of China. Yeah. Who owns the container? Um, well, it's a little bit like 50-50. So the blue line, that are containers owned by carriers. So actually those who transport it are needed for their, for their operations. Um, the container shipping lines. And the other one, the orange one, is um, our leasing companies. So companies who are buying containers and rent it out. It's a little bit like car rental. Yeah? Sometimes on, uh, on a longer basis, sometimes on a shorter basis. Yeah? The reason is a little bit about, um, well, yeah, it's, it's first, of course, um, capital bound. So some companies do not want to buy, bind their capital too much. That's one idea. Another idea is about that you have a lot of special containers. So the box I, I am here showing always is, well, the standard normal dry box. And uh, but there are also some other special boxes like reefers, so with retrofit refrigeration units, controlled environment. There are with open top, there are flats, only platforms and such alike. Yeah. And all those special stuff is actually um, is subject to leasing companies. Yeah. Because you need it, if you need it, you need it. If you don't need it, you don't need it. Yeah. So anyway, if you, for example, uh, you do not have a, a van if you know maybe about three times in your life you will move house. Yeah? So there is no need. Yeah? If I need it, I take it. Yeah? Personally, for example, I also I do not own a car for the last 20 years. Whenever I need a car, I get some. Yeah? And today it gets more and more easier yeah? with car sharing and such alike. Yeah? And but there are also some others. <laughs> Others, you see the small gray uh, topping here. There is one, maybe one company, I have to have maybe uh, give an example for this. Uh, maybe you know the Aquavit Linie. That's a Norwegian Aquavit, so a Norwegian schnapps. And the specialty about this Norwegian schnapps is he has to travel, and that's part of the production process, by the way. He has to travel from Norway to Australia and back. Well, it gets more sound than the taste. I don't know. So that they and actually they, they this was some sort of serendipity because they uh, forgot some barrels and they the barrels uh, came forth and back from 
from um, Australia and then it tasted better than before. Yeah, and now they, they want to mimic this, yeah, but it didn't work. So until today, they are traveling, they are let them travel forth and back in old oak barrels and they have their own containers, of course, because they use it as a production, sort of production process. Yeah. Yeah. The ship, the container. Well, we had a container now. Now we are looking a little bit on the ships. Well, the, the ship growth is, was extraordinary, of course. Um, so you see here the first ships had about 500 TUs. 500 TU ships uh, you see on the River Danube today, if you see some. Yeah, actually there are no. Um, and then of course the ship growth you see over the centuries and decades uh, the ships went went bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, in 2014 we were in this range of new Panamax. That means that the Panamax Canal can be reached after he was widened. Yeah? So that's actually also the naming here. So Panamax was the retrist, uh, the, the, um, well the binding, yeah? binding um, thing, so that's the B part, Panamax, up to 4,500. And uh, afterwards those ships could not pass the Panama Canal. They could pass, or they can pass, all they can pass, the Suez Canal. Yeah? but both widened it in order to accommodate maybe much larger ships that may come. I don't know. 2015, so two years ago, there was uh, the MS Oscar was the biggest ship. 19,000 TUs. Yeah? 19,000 TUs. That is about 20,000% um, more than Idlex. You see on the left hand side. That was the first ship. Yeah. It means that, for example, you could uh, approximately put on about, about 200 cars on the Idle Lakes, whereas you have a big parking lot for ni over 19,000 cars on the MS Oscar. Yeah. But it gets bigger. And But before I take bigger, I have to introduce actually the ship in front. Now this is a model, it's not a really the scale, it's a little bit smaller yeah, in scale than the original one. And that's one model of the MERS Triple E. Triple E means economic, efficient and economic, efficient and eco-friendly, eco yes, eco-friendly. And uh, so the, the chip is actually more environmental friendly than ever shipped before. It's bigger yeah, than ever before and it's more cheaper to transport a container by this ship, yeah? But it gets bigger. About three weeks ago, um, the 20,000 TO mark was, break, uh, was uh, over jumped by the so-called MOL Triumph. Actually, when I look on this, of this row of biggest container ship ever, you can feel it's a little bit like a um, group of male people being on a um, tour, and everybody says, okay, I have the biggest car. No, I have the biggest one, or something else. Yeah? So yeah, they're, they're showing uh, you want to have the biggest container ship. Yeah? So everybody wants to have the biggest container ship at some time. Now it's small, um, that's Mitsui OS Car Lines. Uh, Japanese company has now the biggest ship. Yeah, having biggest ships. So we are in, the, in this fleet capacity issue. Um, here you see the fleet capacity uh, of container shipping uh, from, from 1970 to 2016. The small brown line below, these are those ships who may are allowed or have some uh, installations to make transports, or co put on containers on and fix it on the, on the ship deck. Um, but the red one are, is actually the real fleet. Yeah? So actually you, could, you can on every ship you can put a couple of containers, but most of the containers are transported with this, with this ship like uh, whoop, the mold you see here. There is nothing than some 
so-called cell guide fences yeah, to keep the containers in, in, uh, in line yeah, and nothing else. Yeah. So what you need is also here, of course, some infrastructure on the shoreline. Yeah. Whereas you have seen this the ship before, they had also some grains, so-called dairy grains, stack grains. Um, so the real full ships, uh, full container ships are the most and then accompanied by multi-purpose, that's, that's those ships with dairy grains, uh, smaller ships uh, have also general cargo, so some other boxes, uh, wooden boxes, yachts or something else will be put on. And also row-row ships and row-row container ships, yeah? so ferries actually. Yeah? So you can drive in, they have a big, uh, a big door in the back and you can drive in everything, roll in what you want. And if you look on these ships, the red line here, this also you can see in the 90s, it gets steep, and it gets even steeper in the 2000s. Because in 2006, Maersk st started this raid for having the biggest ships. And this was the first one was Emma Maersk. Emma was um, 10,500 TUs, and actually they could load about 14,000 TUs. Why this difference? Well, easy to explain. There is a difference between a container empty and a container full. And if you take full containers, it's about 10,500. Yeah? Otherwise, the ship will sink. Yeah? And if you just take, take empty containers, yeah, you have uh, totally less weight, then you can, of course, have more sp space to accommodate containers. That's 14,000. And you see here, really, it gets deep up uh, after 2000, and it gets even more and more and more, and grows and grows and grows and grows. You don't see any break in here in this graph um, because of economic crisis. Yes, there was no. Yeah. And you see also the blue line. The blue line is that's about effective capacity. That means if you have containers, for example, of different sizes, um, you cannot put too much container on each other. Yeah? So normally you can put about six on each other, but if you have a container which is uh, a little bit more high, higher, high, higher than the others, that's are the so-called high cubes containers, you cannot uh, put six on each other, only five. So you have a loss, some loss. Yeah? So if you also look here on the model, you can see they should actually, they should a little bit have a look outside. Yeah? You cannot put everywhere containers. They should have a round view from the bridge. Yeah? Yes, um, so there is really a difference you see here, really a gap between this, what is on the market actually, and what is um, actually used. Yeah? And this of course has an impact on freight rates. Freight rates, it's really, a fascinating issue in uh, container shipping. Um, last summer I was on a conference, Maritime Economist Conference, got Best Paper Award because I had a, sh had a paper about how to deal with uh, forecasting of freight rates. Yeah. And uh, yeah, they were really fascinated. Oh, I, I'm a, yeah, a rather young researcher yeah, and I'm rather new in this, this, this area, but uh, we got the Best Paper Award because we were yeah, young and fresh about how to do it, how to deal with this topic. Yeah. A colleague of mine from the UK, he said, when I said, okay, we will, we will have such a paper, he said, okay, we tried this in the 90s and it didn't work. Okay, yes, we did it and it worked. Anyway, you see here the freight rates and um, you see also here 2008, you see also this lump down in the freight rates. So the red one is from Far East to Europe, and um, the blue one is the other way around. So actually it's really cheap when we have, we Europeans want to ship something to China, Japan, or South Korea. It's really cheap because we have less to ship. There's less uh, cargo to ship. And um, actually what we ship is also not so much worth the money. Yeah? Maybe you have already heard. So the most uh, goods shipped, for example, bound or shipped to China from Europe as well as the US are uh, raw materials and secondary raw resources. So that's plastic bottles or cardboard paper used or glass. Yeah. Well, 
the rest is done there at China. Yeah? So if, we are, if you are going out in, uh, to Maria Hilferstraße and do shopping, yeah, the high street shopping, what sort of stuff is really done at Austria, at Europe? Yeah? Maybe the oldest, more luxurious things, and maybe food stuff more, so specialties, but all the, the normal sto sort of stuff, food work, um, toys, and uh, such a like, it's most of them is, uh, is done somewhere in China. Okay, there are some few exceptions. For example, about 50% of toys are made in Europe still, but there are actually two manufacturers. If you go in a toy shop, you can see this. Yeah, that's one is a Playmobil, and the other one is we see here in front. That's Lego. Yeah, both are still European made, but the rest. Anyway, here about about the sh about the prices, yeah, sh freight rates. It's, uh, you see this lump, and then you see the rest of this uh, graph until today. You feel, oh, the price is heavily deteriorating, and that's actually about 2015. The price went really down. Even that's even lower. You got even lower prices than in the height of the crisis economic crisis. And I think there was no price in 2015, isn't it? Anyway, we can also have a look, a, a closer look on that, and you can see here that's always uh, got very volatile here. The upper part is uh, Shanghai to Northern Europe, that's our spot rates, it means that's are the freight rates closed before a ship leaves the port. Yeah? So it's not contracted long in advance, but it's really a spot rate. And you can see here that's rather on the left-hand side in the, in the 2009, 10, 11 was rather calm. And then you see always going up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. And it's actually because uh, shipping lines said, oh, uh, we have too much capacity anyway, but uh, we want to have a reasonable price. So we could maybe mm, increase the price, try to increase. And that's so-called GRI, cross-rate increase. So he said, um, yeah, next month we are asking for about 1,000 US dollar more. And um, the other shipping lines agreed to this and also said, yeah, it's 1,000 more. But you see the market didn't work. Yeah? So you see these tooth, tooth uh, teeth sort of uh, going up, jumping up, and then deteriorating after some time, deteriorating some time. That's the same here between... Northern Europe, uh, Chi Shanghai, Northern Europe, but also Mediterranean to some certain extent, yes. And that's, by the way, therefore I got the best paper award. Yeah. Um, after these uh, too many figures, maybe something which is uh, more entertaining. Um, I took Alan Secuda pictures, and after looking on them, I found out a lot of companies are not lo longer existing or were acquired by others. So this picture, for example, here is from, uh, from the mid-90s, by Alan Secula, and the circled, the circled container is from American President Line, which is now belongs to SEMA CGM, Company uh, General Maritime, Company Maritime Affrebement. Um, they acquired them uh, last year. Another one here, you see the container here, also Secula, Alan Secula uh, picture. And this is China shipping, was acquired or merged with Costco last year. Sealand, the founder actually, so Alan McLean's company, Sealand, was acquired by Maersk, AP Moller Group, a couple of years ago. This here is a picture from the 90s. Yeah. Uh, by the way, that's also here very, this was a very, very freight forward looking um, technology here. That was the first unguided vehicle, so, uh, so called HGV, automatic guided vehicle, which was used at uh, Rotterdam, Mars Flakte, when they started their operations there. So you don't need any driver for this truck here. You see, you, there is nothing to drive here, yeah, no steering, nothing. And they have magnets and uh, just magnets in the on the floor in order to guide them, yeah, the vehicles. So this was mid '90s already. Um, another one, Ned Lloyd. 
was also acquired by Maersk subsequently. CSURF, that's from Forgotten Space in 2010, yeah, the movie from, from 2010. CSURF was acquired last year, beginning of last year, by Habak Lloyd. Yeah. And last but not least, Han Xin. Han Xin, maybe you have heard in the, uh, in the news. Han Xin was, uh, was really exciting issue. The company was very successful actually over the years and got a little bit of a crisis and then they went bankruptcy last year. Last year in July and now the company is resolved, all assets are sold and they ended company the operations ended a couple of weeks ago. At that time they were number seven in the world by size. And in July when they when they really filed bankruptcy, they had about two million containers in operation. About ninety ships in operation. And it was really exciting to see what happened. Yeah. They just ran out of money. But this is really not the only thing. Last year was really exceptional. It's actually exceptional by any means in any industries I have seen so far. I have seen a lot of my industries. The last year was really tremendous turmoil, turnover. Conversation National, you see on the right hand side, um, the Conversation National, they said, oh, we in November, in November issue, they said four weddings and a funeral. So you see down below Han Chin in the funeral and the wedding cakes yeah, of the others. Interesting, uh, you see, I, I tweaked a little bit the, the headline because um, in December another wedding happened. Yeah? Maybe you have heard. Maersk, Scarpe Moller Group, the largest shipping company in the world, the Danish company, acquired Hamburg Süd. Hamburg Süd is a quite special company um, because it's uh, part or was part of Dr. Oetker. You know, bakery stuff, yeah, pudding and such alike. And actually, it was a small asset of uh, Hamburg, Hamburg Süd. was a small asset of Dr. Oetker Group. But in the meantime, the last years, it was the largest contributor to the profit line or Croatia's co contributed actually to the turnover, but not such like to the profits of Dr. Oetker. So they earned more money by shipping than by selling pudding, pulp, powder, or some other stuff for cooking. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's changed a lot. Yeah, this was really, that was really tremendous. And um, yeah, so far, um, about the shipping and the shipping lines, maybe now a little bit about the Forgotten Space. Yeah? Forgotten Space, the film by Alan Sekula, tells us also other stories. Other stories about the trades and actually what is behind the trades and what are the reasons for such trades. Yeah? Here you can see um, east, west, north, south and interregional trade. So that's all the figures by TU, not by tonnages. So that's only the, go the goods who are transported by, by containers. What you can see is here, the red one is east-west. That's the normal trade routes between ch Southeast Asia, China, South Korea, US, Canada, and Europe. And you see the blue one, that's north-south. North-south trade is much, much more less, but it's also increasing. Yeah? Of course, we have these uh, new kids on the block, that means the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, yeah, and China. Um, and uh, sometimes the S is also included South Africa. But what is really more and more uh, growing is actually the interregional trade. That means trade within Europe. That means trade within Southeast Asia. Yeah? There are a lot of consumers there. There are a lot of islands. They are all connected with each other. Well, what is the impact of the container on the straits? Well, before the 70s, we had almost bulk cargo. So a lot of things were produced where they were sold. 
And from the 70s to the 90s, actually, the factors of production were mobilized. Yeah? So it was possible to do, for example, clothes, stuff, footwear, toys, were produced more and more in China, maybe first at Taiwan, maybe first at Japan, then there was the race of the South Koreans also. Um, and it was really facilitated by container shipping, heavily facilitated. After the 90s even, it got much more, and it got much like this forgotten space of Alan Secula. Because nowadays, no one cares about from where it comes, most of the time. Yeah? For example, when I ask my students, please tell me um, a product which is genuine of US American origin. They raise their hands and they say, Apple. What do I will answer to them? Well, turn around your laptop, turn around your iPad, look on the back once. Made in China. Funnily, the made in China is only a small fraction, actually, of the production cost, of the value of this laptop or iPad. That's maybe 5%. The rest comes from somewhere else. Taiwan, US, even Europe. Yeah? And of course, uh, the profit margin is also not very low for such an iPad. Yeah. <laughs> or MacBook, yeah. Anyway, um, we are talking, we logisticians, uh, we are talking about global value chains. Yeah. So it does not matter where we are producing, uh, unless it's cheap. Uh, it should be cheap. So uh, things are transported all over the world, sometimes which does not make any sense. Yeah? But for example, here, it, come, it can come, come also uh, when we have jokes a little bit, it makes it better. Um, on the left-hand side, for example, it's about a product. Um, well, they have to make a decision about some electronic product. Um, I don't know, receiver, um, tape recorder, video record, I don't know yeah, what, they, what, they are, uh, what they are buying, want to buy. But actually, she reads and says, okay, this product was made in 27 different countries, um, encompassing a wide variety of political and environmental philosophies. You have to decide. That's actually, we have always to decide, yeah? We can see that's made in China, okay. We can see that's made in Bangladesh. Sometimes we try to uh, buy things which are not from there, but it gets hard, yeah? There's one book, um, there's one a book about, um, was made by a journalist, a Italian, actually Italian heritage journalist living in the US, uh, Miss Piccolini, and she wrote a, she wrote a book about um, one year without China. Um, really hilarious book. They are living in the Midwest, that's the setting, M living in the Midwest, have a small kid, a girl, a little bit more elder son, both school kids, and, well, her husband. Um, and then, for example, she wants to, she, she makes a decision on January the 1st, one year without China. And she has sometimes sleepless nights. For example, they need a mouse trap because there's a mouse in the house. And they want to, they want to buy um, a mouse trap and they go, go to this uh, store market, Walmart, something. And they have a choice, a very hard decision to make because they get two sorts of mouse traps. One is really friendly, mouse friendly mouse trap. It's out of plastic, it just um, locks in the mouse and you can release the mouse afterwards, yeah, somewhere in the wilderness. Or you take the classic one, yeah, clap, <coughs> yeah. So it's that. And this is a US American, yeah. But this is only a start of uh, several episodes, she tells us. Um, there's one, for example, the, um, uh, the, little, the little daughter wants to have a Barbie. Hmm, how to find a Barbie without being from China? I made a test. I found one. There was one made at Philippines. That was uh, I have was one out of two hundreds maybe. Yeah, was really made in Philippines. Yeah. Um, she wants to buy shoes for the son. He needs sports shoes for the son. He it took takes her about three weeks to get um, to get sh some shoes. 
they are from France. She uh, calls up about, I think, 20 shoe manufacturers and everybody could not tell her or told her yet it's from China. And uh, the French one didn't say directly and she thought, okay, that's in good faith, I buy it. Yeah. The price tag was about 150 US dollars. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it works, but it is a little bit more expensive. Yeah. And so it's a, a line of, of uh, episodes she tells us about that. And maybe the best one is um, she wakes up by night really swearing. <sighs> is Hong Kong also China? And Taiwan? Hmm. Yeah. So you have to decide. Yeah. The second one, maybe you don't have any decision. Um, yeah, what country was it made in the car? Well, what part of the car you want uh, to know from where it is? Actually, we are buying cars from Germany. German cars are made somewhere in Hungary, assembled. Yeah? Or some other German cars are actually uh, the, the, the steel. The steel is made at, at Austria. They are well together the chassis at Slovakia, and then they made the end uh, assembly at Germany in order to make made in Germany put on, yeah? So, pff, you don't know. The more complex the product gets, the more complex are also the supply chains, and actually it's global, yeah? Even, um, for example, a BMW and Audi, or a Mercedes or Porsche, they have about 10% China in it, anyway, yeah? So cables and some plastics is, is from China. Yes, um, well, actually, it would be not a problem, but, and again, back to Alan Segula. It's about the I take I uh, call it value added. Yeah, but um, actually, Alan Segula is more Marxist. Yeah, and I know you are also more. Yeah, than I. And sometimes I'm also Marxist when I'm talking about value added because it's the same. I call it as an economist value added. Marx, it's also value added. He has a bit, maybe a little bit more other background for it. But it's, it's really a problem, who earns the money, yeah? when we are buying something. Yeah? And oops, I have two examples of this. One is about uh, the t-shirt. Yeah, everybody knows a t-shirt. And we will have a t-shirt uh, with a price tag of about 29 euros. Yeah? So that's not the lowest price. That's an okay, reasonable price. And if you look then down, what is the breakdown of the cost, you see in the upper right corner, you can see that 80 cents is for the worker making the t-shirt. Huh? Then about, um, about um, 27 cents for uh, the overhead. The profit of the manufacturer at Bangladesh is about 1 euro 15. The intermediary who actually made the contract with them it's about one euro twenty. And then we have transport cost in total, yeah, for the whole for the whole supply chain in total of about two euro nineteen. And uh, what I really it's not my it's not a my graph, but uh, but a little little bit suspect is that the material costs are in total three euros forty. So that's a maybe a more quality high quality T-shirt. Yeah. Um, by the way, you know from where cotton normally comes. Well, we think sometimes, oh yeah, that should be India or something like this, yeah? No, bullshit. It's the US, it's Texas. Because at Texas, they have industrialized cotton. Uh, cotton, raising up cotton, yeah? That's, uh, they have farms, they are square kilometers, hectares of cotton plants, yeah? There. So that's the biggest pro producer. By the way, the US, when, when Mr. Trump says, oh yeah, um, buy America, do America, and such a like. Okay, yes, uh, they, ha they would, have, would have enough resources and food stuff, but actually they will starve a lot of things they like. Yeah? So we could not be without China and Taiwan and Japan because um, you know, they will really miss their MacBooks and iPhones and such a like. Yeah? And clothes and footwork and toys. Yeah? Everything, everything comes from there. Yeah, and um, maybe the most striking issue is about that the brand manufacturer already earns about 12% percent 
And then the retailer at the end, he makes the price tag, 59%. Yeah? And that's real. Yeah. So they actually, um, those who are in the very start of the supply chain, of this global value chain, they do not earn a penny. Yeah? They are have the most work on the t-shirt and they earn the least. Yeah? And this is, of course, it's um, well a little bit of engineering also of taxes and duty levels. Yeah, that is also one one one, uh, one favorite of mine. Yeah, when I'm teaching, yeah, you can really engineer everything here. You keep the value of this T-shirt as long as long you can low, and then you are labeling it. Yeah. So a lot of lot of stuff is really coming in a more or less neutral way to Europe. And afterwards, you make some small embroidery or put the labels in, yeah, make a fancy outfit of this, and then it gets, well, reasonably high-priced yeah, in their point of view. Another example is uh, Fiji water. Maybe you have heard about. If you are in the US and you go to a 7-Eleven shop, so such a corner shop you find actually in every second corner in the inner city of uh, in the US. And you look, uh, look at the fridge and you want to have some still water, you get Fiji water. And Fiji water is really water from Fiji. Yeah? That's from the Mount Letuvo. It's a special water because it's was, uh, it was filtered by volcanic rock. And there is um, there is an underneath basin, and there was a Canadian who discovered this and started to make uh, production and some business out of this. Um, I'm a little bit tracking tracking uh, just for curiosity. I'm a little bit tracking how many bill of ladings, how many containers are loaded at Fiji uh, for Fiji water, and I see that every week. 200, 300, 400 containers of water are going out. Yeah. Um, most of them are sold in the US. They have a market share of about 3% of all still water sold in the US. And um, recently I saw it also uh, already in the supermarket in Germany. And even with a markdown price. Yeah. The normal the price is about 2 euros. Yeah, and you get it less for 2 euros if it's marked down a little bit. Oh, what the hell? Yeah. Um, finally, we can say, okay, that's, that's, that, that's really no go, no way. Yeah? And there maybe there are many other waters uh, we can also buy. There is a New Zealand water, there is, uh, there is another one from Norway, a still water, you can buy this FOSS. Yeah? And all, it's all water, you actually, at Vienna, you, need, you don't need. Yeah? Because at Vienna, we have the best water, more or less, I've heard. Yeah, you know, I've heard. And um, so actually there is no need to buy it. Yeah? But uh, some, other can, uh, some other cities, maybe they feel they need it. Yeah? And of course, uh, it's uh, heavily advertised also, the Fiji water. So a lot of celebrities use it and say, yeah, yes, that's the best water, blah, blah, and so on. You can get it in uh, four or five different sizes. Yeah? So for every use, you get the right, the right size. The right size. Um, and, um, yeah, well, tastes, it's water, yeah, it's water, yeah. it does not taste bad, but it's water, yeah. Um, actually, when you, when you're looking uh, from an ecological point of view, it looks first a little bit poor, uh, really insane. So if you look on the right hand side, that was uh, done by a critic. Um, the, he counted up how many miles has such a bottle when it uh, comes to the customer. Yeah? So I have a little bit to go, go forward. So, for example, the labels for Fiji water are from Wellington, New Zealand. That's already about uh, 1,660 miles away, yeah? sea miles away. Um, the bottle tops are coming from Taishung City, uh, Taiwan. That's uh, approximately 5,000 miles away. The distributor is uh, for the U.S. is at Plano, Texas, USA. That's uh, 6,602 uh, miles away, and it may include it may include a travel by train. 
um, because uh, sometimes the routing of, for example, Maersk is such a like that they are driving through the Panama Canal first, yeah, no, second, uh, first through the Panama Canal, and then the cargo has to be shipped back to the other port in order to reach a western, uh, west coast port. Yeah. But anyway, there are direct lines in order to accommodate Fiji and Fiji water in order to get it uh, fresh to the US. Yeah, and uh, now we also get it fresh in the supermarket. I think also soon we'll be here. Anyway, if you want to test it, I think uh, without making a, a any advertisement, I think you can get it already at uh, Meinl am Graben. I think I have already seen it. Yeah, they have all specialties anyway. Um, yes, the plastic, the plastic bottles are quite iconic, so they are really uh, rectangle ones. Yeah, when you look at it from the side, you see that's a rectangle one, in order to do not waste too much space in the container, um, and they have to be blown up. So there's a special, there's a special way to get small, small uh, bottles. That's a raw bottles, yeah, really smaller, and then you blow it up with some steam in order to get the uh, the, in it the, the, well, the final bottle. Yeah. And these bottles, plastic planks, they're coming from Allentown, Pennsylvania, so it's from the east coast of US. Yeah. That's about 8,000 miles away. So the total journey of the bottle will be about 20,000 miles. Yeah. Bim. Yeah, and you get it in ever, ever 7-Eleven. So from the environmental point of view, okay, that's no go. But I made a case study about this, and I just researched a little bit in the in the internet. And you can also find here some rationale why Fiji water also could be favorable. Yeah. So one is, for example, they say, oh, we are giving people on Fiji work. That's right. That's about 200 people having work, and that's actually nothing. Yeah where they are producing these, bo these bottles and fill it up. The manufacturing side itself, but however, the manufacturing side itself needs some extra, um, extra generators in order to have enough electricity to have the filling, the bottling plant being run. Yeah? So they have diesel generators uh, all at each machine in order to have enough enough electricity to run all the machines of this filling plant, yeah? And this is in a, really in such a jungle-like atmosphere, yeah? yeah? You hear always the motors running, yeah, the engines running. Um, another issue is also about, um, of course, Fiji is an island, so a lot of Fijis wa wants also all the stuff we want, but they cannot produce it. So everything which is not what does not grow up at Fiji, or you cannot find at Fiji, has to be put to Fiji. And that's also containers. So the, the rationale is a little bit, and that's maybe a little bit more in favor of Fiji, is of course when Fijians wants to have food stuff and such like that, get it in a container. And if they would not have be Fiji border, they had to put the containers empty back. Yeah? So we're actually are riding on the empty leg of the of the shipping companies, yeah, uh, services. That's one another idea. Yeah. And then they have some service, uh, such uh, social services and such a like, and they make education, uh, everything. That's a little bit like the Demade sheets, yeah, of Red Bull. Here is also spends a hell of money on sports, yeah, um, and yes, and also this is some. Uh, some excuse, yeah, why his uh, beverage is so sweet, yeah. Anyway, um, and of course it's economic viable, yeah. The, the business model works, yeah. They are they are earning a hell of money with this just bottled water, yeah. Yes, um, and one last thing before I end and we get into the discussion is, it's not only about things. Which are um, which are impacted by or um, well people abroad somewhere in the world which are impacted by containerism. Sometimes also people very close to us are impacted. And this picture here is from Forgotten Space, a still from Forgotten Space. You see here the container crane in the back and a small town, and I think you don't see anyone. Yes, this dwell 
Duell is a small town which is too close between, or well too close to the container terminal of Antwerp, the port of Antwerp. It's too close to the border of Netherlands. And the problem is the port of Antwerp needs expansion. And if you look on the map of the port of Antwerp or the Antwerp area, you can see that the only space with a shoreline left at Antwerp for expanding the port area is around Doel. And they just closed down this town. Yeah. So after 100 years of, of life there, all the, the people had to go. And then they just excavated everything now in order to have a bigger port. Yeah. But this is actually this was the last, really the last resort plan because they do not have any coastline left at Belgium in this area of Antwerp to mm, well to enlarge the port um, the port size. Yeah. Bop. So I'm at the end. Um, maybe you know better about the story about the picture. Maybe. I don't know too much about the story about this image, but um, this image is part of a work called Dear Bill Gates. And it's made in front of the house of Bill Gates, uh, at that time being the richest person in the world, uh, the founder and owner of Microsoft. And uh, Ellen Zekula made this image in reference to a quite interesting story. Uh, Bill Gates bought uh, a painting uh, out on the banks, I think it's called, uh, by an American painter. Uh, and it was at that time that the highest priced sell of an American painter in history. So this was the richest man in the world, being an American, buying the highest priced image uh, ever sold by an auction for an American painter. And Alan Zekuler is swimming in front of Bill Gates' house. He's making, I think, a series of three or four images. And then he's writing a short letter. And in this letter, he's commenting on, in a very funny way. Alan Zekuler loved also humor. You could find it in all of his works. So I mean, even though the tone is very sincere and the topic is very sincere, but there's always space, I think, for humor, too. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's, uh, that's, that's him. And then he, he then would write in this story that actually he thinks that Dear Bill, uh, as a fellow citizen, I have to tell you, you pay too much for this painting. I mean, it's nice, but still, you know, like $30 million, that's just too much. And, and it's actually, I always use it to, this work, uh, Dear Bill Gates, to explain um, Alan Zekula's take on what it means to understand and what it means to interpret and what are the capacities of the image, triggering your understanding, triggering your uh, production of meaning in context of class relation and class positioning, right? Because the big difference that Alan Zikula is opening up then is what does Bill Gates see in this uh, painting out on the banks? And what does Zikula as a historian know about the actual historical uh, conditions that surround these living and working conditions of these people that are fishing? This is a painting about two guys on a boat out on the banks fishing and trying to make a living. So that, that's, that's the story about this image and, and, and where, where it comes from and what it's... it's and there's all here and there, there's always self-portraits of Alan Zekuler, like in a, in a playful way. Yeah, but, but there's a lot of questions that I actually yeah. have. Uh, possibly also our audience uh, has some questions, would like to know some things, I don't know. I will start with one, uh, but then immediately I would hand out the microphone to you so you can also engage in the conversation. Uh, you, you mentioned Marx and you addressed me as a Marxist, which <laughs> is not really like 100% uh, adequate, but, <laughs> but, but I would have really liked about, I mean, thank you again for this amazing presentation, uh, all the facts, all the numbers, all everything put in, it's still hard to grasp because it's, it's, it's representations through, through numbers and things, but just to see the explosion of the dimensions and the, the outreach and all these things, is just incredible. Uh, and with, with a Marxist perspective, uh, it's this, these things are very much about exploitation and appropriation and about... Um, so my question, it might be a twofold, is 
um, how do you see these developments in the shipping industry uh, in, in the broader context of the outreach of capitalist systems of production, right? You, you mentioned this Fiji model, actually, you gave an example there, but maybe there's even more we can. Uh, what's the enabling factor, I think we called it, for companies that's based in these shipping industries to create global production chains which really reach out into the furthest uh, last islands mm. on the continent. You know, like this is because this is something that we're always trying to discuss within the context of uh, Okeanos. Mm. Like how, 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 I mean, you were, you were an economist, so you have a more profound knowledge about that. And how important do you think is this development? Uh, is this push? Uh, that's the first question. And then the second question, maybe you can link it how important is this aspect of fright rates, mm -hmm. of speculation, of, um, yeah, uh, of playing the lottery of the mm -hmm. sea mm -hmm. to actually understand our material culture that we live in right now, which you have so beautifully um, unfolded? Maybe first, uh, first about, if, about the fright rates. Um, what I maybe what I didn't address too much was about uh, how much got actually liner shipping, so shipping normal goods, not bulk goods, how much they, they got more efficient. Just by introducing the container in the 70s, um, 50s, 70 to 70s, actually the, um, the efficiency multiplied by six. So actually, after, after introducing a container, it was possible to load and unload a ship of that time, not in six days, but in one day. Uh, so this was the first tremendous, tremendous step. And then, of course, it went further. Um, nowadays, uh, container, container yards do not have actually, well, you do not see any people there. Yeah? If you have HEVs, so these automatic guided vehicles, maybe you have one on the crane, ship to shore crane, and maybe two guys uh, looking about uh, those locks, locking the containers together, and make some inspection, that's all. Yeah? The rest is automatized. So it is, it's tremendous cheap. But if you look here on the prices, it's, well, the, the, the bottom line was in, in about 2015, yeah, you can see on on this on this graph, I hope it's worth me here. For example, the bottom line was about less than 500 US dollar for a 20 foot container, the whole way from China to Europe. Actually, if it hits ground at Hamburg and you want to have it in Vienna, you have maybe to pay another 500, no, about 1,000 maybe. So double the price in order to get it to Vienna, to your premises. Yeah. A truck, a truck a day costs about 500 euros. Yeah. And for this price, we get just a container from China to Europe. Yeah. And then we did, uh, divide it by the things, the stuff inside. Yeah. How many t-shirts we get in a container? 10,000, 20,000, yeah. a lot. And then we divide it by, then it are only pennies. Yeah. Yes, it got so cheap. It, everything got so cheap. So you can do what you want. That's not, that's not a problem. Yeah. And if you, for example, if you want to wanna be uh, well, a little bit more less China, you want to have less China on your product, just produce at Mauritius. Some T-shirts, those e eco-friendly T-shirts are made at Mauritius. Where is Mauritius? Somewhere in the African coastline north of Madagascar. Yeah. What I've heard, maybe 50% of those T-shirts are anywhere from China. So there is so some fraud and action made about this. So they are they're, they're just say, okay, yes, that's Mauritius. But what I do is, what I do is just um, they, they ship it to Dubai. It's one of these big, uh, big uh, hubs yeah, in, this, in this network. And the T-shirts disappear maybe for about four weeks in a warehouse, and the paperwork is just done as they would ship 
down from Dubai to Mauritius and back. Yeah. I was never at Mauritius, but I could not believe that I have so many manufacturing sites to make all the t-shirts for Mauritius at Mauritius anyway. Yeah. Or there are ships making t-shirts with Chinese people on it. They are from China bound to US or bound to Europe and they're making the t-shirts on the ship. So half of the t-shirts are already made and the other half is made during the journey. Yeah. Well, if you can, if you can have people, uh, people for little money, you will do it. Yeah. And even beyond, um, even beyond this, some manufacturer of, for example, clothes, they claim that they are producing at Europe. Yeah. Some of them. That's the, the big brands, especially. Yeah. Where do they produce? Not at Austria, not at Germany, not at uh, Scandinavia or somewhere else. The least cost principle is also valid here. They are producing at Romania, and if Romania is too expensive, they go to Moldova. Moldova is at the moment at a little bit the bottom line. Uh, we have an hourly wage of about uh, 1 euro 50. How much is the minimum wage here? Hmm? Seven, eight, six, six, seven, eight euros. Yeah. And they have almost the same prices in the supermarket. So I don't know how, how the people can, can live on this. Yeah. But what was the first question? <laughs> <laughs> it, it was kind of connected. I mean, you, yep, you, you, did, you, did, you did answer it. Like, I, I just wanted to know, like, because we, we titled this the Lottery of the Sea and yep. we were talking about um, global production chains, yep. global supply chains. Yep. And from a Marxist perspective, like what we have also been discussing before, it's so, it's so interesting to, to see these value chains, yep. like to put things, to put a price on something, yep. to, to transform something from a raw material or for a, from, a, from, a, from, a, from a, a person into a a product with a price or a person with a wage, right? Like this is this is something to include people into a production process and therefore make them part of a bigger global system of and and that's just and how the shipping industry actually you could say furthered the outreach, made it more efficient. But I think you answered it for for a certain amount. Uh one I come come into as you say, shipping around. There is another there is it was actually a case study I got I got some some um, years ago, and um, there is a company mm, they make uh, coffee machines, such uh, French coffee machines were to press the French coffee uh, machines were to press the coffee out, yeah, so steam it up and press the coffee out. Um, those coffee machines are, for example, made uh, actually original by a British company. The British company initially made the coffee machines in the UK, but it was too expensive. So they outsourced it to, the, to China. But some parts, some of the steel parts of this machine are still made in the UK. So they are putting all those parts together in a container, 120 foot is enough maybe for half a year, and then bring them to China. China these coffee makers are made there, handmade also, and then sent to the UK back. And now, what if a Chinese wants to have such a coffee maker of the British company? Of course, they are testing, packaging something, and they are sending back to China. So the product is sent once, ready-made, to Europe and back to China, because even the Chinese want to pay the price. If you are China, I was uh, at least once I was in China, and if you are going to Walmart, you you cannot believe that they have a huge fraction of the Walmart is dedicated to milk, yeah, milk from outside China. Now, and for example, if you if it's uh, again starting season and you are maybe in the first district, and you go to uh, some drugstore, you can see that the baby powder shelf they are indicating on the baby powder shelf in English and Japanese and Chinese, you are only allowed to buy free packages. Yeah? 
because the Chinese wants to have milk and milk powder from Europe because it's better quality for them. Yeah? So actually, when a customer wants it, yeah, he gets it. And also, if you think about uh, now these last weeks, if you go to the supermarket, yeah, and well, you just look about the vegetables, yeah, for example, and fruits. Yeah, what do you get? What the hell do you get? Yeah, you get strawberries all the year, yeah, and apples all the year. Yeah, no wonder. Yeah, you get everything all the year. Um, well, I, I'm not so quite old uh, to remember that we didn't get any everything, anything, but I felt in my childhood, uh, so in the 70s, we didn't get everything all the time, yeah, because there was no season, yeah. But today, for everything is every time season. It's just the price tag, and from where does it come, yeah? Or um, the um, ice cream. For example, yeah, ice cream is normally produced now for summer. Yeah. Some ice cream is not produced. Some ice cream sold by ice cream companies here at Austria is not made at Austria, is not made at Europe, is made in South America. Because it's cheaper to make it there, but we have uh, refrigerated containers anyway. Does not matter. They have for the moment summer season. So they can produce now for Europe summer season. Yeah. Or uh, if we think about uh, meat, yeah, we like we like steaks from other time. Yeah. Or another 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 topic. We a lot of people like ve vegan. Yeah. Drinking vegan, eating vegan. Yeah. But this is also uh, some really awesome things are done because of this. For example, if you, if you look at a Coke, they state it's vegan. I say, yes, it's okay, yes, I know, that's vegan. Yeah? That's sugar, water, something else, yeah, of course. Yeah? But now look, for example, on, on the manna waffles. Manna waffles are vegan. Why? Because they now use palm oil in order to make the waffles. Palm oil is really, that's really devastating for those areas where they produce the palm oil. Yeah? And we are even put it in, uh, in the tank of our cars yeah, when there is a need. Yeah? So we have, this, we have, for example, the diesel now with E10, 10% 10 extra, extra vegetable something. Yeah? Um, and well, we need some alcohol to put in to exchange for the diesel, yeah? so 10% we have to put in and sometimes palm oil is the thing, sometimes methanol, sometimes ethanol, but everything is somehow green made, yeah. So whether it's uh, whether are soya beans or grain stuff or something, something has to be has to be raised up for this, yeah. Um <coughs> yeah. As you explained, every product is a, in an economical way, a very complex object, yeah? Um, and as you described the uh, example with the strawberries or something like this, what do you think happened if, for example, all citizens in Austria, or maybe Austria is too, too uh, small, or in, in middle Europe, decided, decide together no, we don't buy strawberries this winter. What do you think happened then? Is there a kind of butterfly effect? Hmm. First, I would not believe that uh, every everybody will agree not to buy strawberries. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah but uh, just okay, as, that's a, that's as that's an one. example, yeah. yeah, yeah so what what happened yeah. if a, a huge yeah, group of people avoid to? Mm. A, pro uh, a, a, a product. Mm. Um, actually, it depends how much industrialized um, are the producers abroad in overseas. Yeah? Some heavily specialized on this, and actually you kill them. Yeah? So that, that, that's, uh, that's just the truth. Yeah? Um, for example, lax salmon is at the moment really on bulk. Yeah? 
So how to get so much salmon? Yeah, well, we know, yeah, Norwegian salmon, yes. But uh, the cheaper one is not from Norway. Uh, the cheaper one it comes from Chile. Uh, so Chile has also such fjords uh, and similar, similar water quality, similar water temperature for for salmon, raising up salmon, so they raise up salmon. If we would not buy the Chilean salmon, they had to eat themselves. Yeah? Uh, maybe the, the salmon could be maybe sold to someone else, yeah? but strawberries, yeah? what is the nutrition facts of strawberries? Okay, what could happen is they downgrade it to smoothies. Yeah? So if they cannot sell them, they have to downgrade and uh, make some musk and uh, put it in smoothies afterwards. Yeah. Um, maybe we we would get maybe then maybe better yogurt quality because you know um, in a strawberry yogurt you have a lot of sugar first, yeah, and that it um, and does not fall apart because you have normally maybe reduced fat, yeah. And the fat bins and the sugar bins, uh, everything together, uh, clues together, and um, then you have some flavor. By the way, uh, strawberry flavor, that's one of the best flavors you can get. Uh, so the you cannot distinguish between normal, normal strawberry and flavor, stra uh, strawberry flavor. Yeah, ma maybe strawberries were, uh, <laughs> were yeah, not a good, no, but <laughs> anyway, a, it's a it's good it's example, yeah, but um, um, any product which is quite complex, you know, and, and has a lot of, of um, mm, stations from, from the, the pr uh, production to the, to the end consumer. I think, I think the question is, like, what happens if uh, on the demand side, uh, through, I'd say, a political decision, because we say now within the European Union we don't want to support this kind of, like, uh, trade policies anymore, and we really are concerned about we actually also have to talk a little bit about the ele ecological costs uh, um, also for of the shipping industry. Maybe you can say something about that. But I think the question then is, so what happens if uh, the demand, demand side breaks in, right? Like if, if and, and what would then happen to to the other end of the world, like with the butterfly effect? Because and uh, with the sh because you mentioned the salmon uh, thing, um, I don't know much about it. I also heard this whole thing about Chile and. One thing you did not mention <laughs> about uh, the first thing is that these uh, lux farming uh, facilities are completely destroying the ecosystems around them because you have so much salmon in these fish tanks and they produce so much uh, um, fish waste and also they have so, uh, w use so much m medicine in order to keep the fish uh, healthy in this really dangerous environment and conf confined environment. So they are completely, and then sometimes you have this kind of like sickness where it could happen that you get like a, a bacterium into the tank and then you have hundreds and thousands of fish dead and it poisons the, the water all around. So the thing is, uh, it's not an answer to your question, but I mean, it's like, but local fisheries already have been destroyed. Ecosystems also already may, may be destroyed. Uh, on the fish markets in Chile, you already get salmon you should really not eat it, you know? And the thing is, uh, like in the sense of like, it's, it's, uh, and it's highly uh, uh, contam contaminated with, 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 I don't know, uh, antibiotics, uh, from the fruit pellets, maybe some heavy, 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 you know, like materials or, or and, and another, f just, just, so just because I find it so fascinating, uh, the amount of, of, of small fish you have to catch and grind down to create the fruit pellets so you can feed the salmon. And do you know what I mean? Like just, just, just like from the protein, like the protein chain, it's 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 amazing. So I think if if, if uh, on a global, uh, this would be my answer, but I'm not even an economist, so I don't even know why I get to. <laughs> but if this breaks in, it's not going back. It's not not go back to what, what what was before, because in many cases the transformation already happened, and it's already too late to go back. So the people actually really depend on these jobs, as shitty as they might be. <laughs> You know, like, and that's that's a real that's a real uh, real challenge also for policy making and 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 so you, you see politicians and 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 and, and dec decision makers might even cling to jobs which are environmentally and socially super destructive, but they are. But maybe. You okay. Uh, somehow there are also good stories to tell. Yeah. Sometimes. Um, 
especially um, we have these eco labels, yeah, and uh, maybe some some of these um, companies who who had really problems with it, yeah, improved a lot yeah, over over time. For example, Nike yeah, improved heavily, so they were really heavily beaten about their uh, policy um, regarding uh, making shoe foot uh, footworks. Um, and now they improved heavily, yeah. But yeah, okay, that's a problem. If we if we do not buy it any longer, uh, either we find some other use for it, yeah, or uh, would they have to downgrade, or they have to really to well, they are rest, yeah, with it with their wasteland, yeah. Um, that's that's really case, yeah. Um, you said something about the environmental. There's one one aspect we didn't, uh, I I wouldn't say overlooked, but I didn't put on too much stress in order to get forward a little bit, but uh, as we have time still, maybe um, some other, some words more about tribal E, and actually the eco-efficiency of shipping. As on high C, there are no rules, actually. Yeah. Um, shipping lines use actually for these big ships and also the smaller ships, they use actually this sort of fuel you will never use. Yeah. Um, that is just a, just a technical issue. So if you have such a barrel of raw oil, you have several fractions in the raw oil. Yeah. And when, for example, even the OMV here at, at Vienna, uh, at Schwechat, down at Schwechat, when they all ha uh, know they have to produce a certain amount of uh, diesel, for example, a certain amount of uh, normal fuel, yeah, or super fuel, um, they cannot escape actually the de determinism of the fraction of this um, consisting inside the raw, raw, uh, raw fuel or raw oil, yeah. So when they are starting to refine it, they get a fraction which is actually gas, some light gas. Yeah. Um, then they get, of course, kerosene, so for the uh, for aviation uh, purposes. Then they get uh, the, the the normal fuel for our cars and uh, machines. Um, then we get diesel diesel of several kinds, so diesel for house use, yeah, for heating, uh, diesel for diesel engines, a diesel, so-called maritime marine diesel, yeah, which is of lower quality, <coughs> and then heavy fuel oil. Heavy fuel oil is such a lower fraction, which is almost solid by normal um, temperature, so by 20 degrees it's um, almost solid, it's a little bit greasy, and you have to heat it up in order to burn it down in an engine. And that's actually used in the ships, yeah? because you cannot use it at land, um, so you have to use it on seas. That's a byproduct actually of our uh, environmental friendly uh, diesel and uh, fuel stuff and so on. and Actually, there is an even worse product down below, and that's so called bitumen. And this is actually how we made our roads. Yeah. The roads and the streets are just filled up with this, and that's actually the really the, the, the lower ground. Yeah. And this you have to heat up until you make a road. Yeah. But there's a little bit of logistics is included, yeah. But it's actually the fact that the the ships itself itself they are uh, regarded as environmental friendly, actually because they are so huge, yeah. So it's just a matter of economies of scale, I would say, as an economist, yeah. Economies of scale. So if you have here about um, tribal E class, uh, 40, 50, 60 thousand containers on board, uh, the 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 division is better, yeah. So of course, yeah. You share a lot of um, a lot of uh, fuel on uh, a little bit more containers, maybe on that. If you would have a smaller ship, yeah. Um, 
and of course, um, for example, um, Europe as well as the US, they have so-called seekers at the moment. They established it a couple of years ago um, to avoid that the ships burn down this crappy diesel, this heavy fuel oil, also in port areas. Yeah, and if you look, for example, at maybe not Rotterdam, but Antwerp or Hamburg, yeah, well, actually, the port is in the city, yeah? and in order to avoid that the emissions are too high, the ships use marine fuel oil. So they have actually two bunkers, two tanks. Uh, whenever they come in this uh, low sulfur area, they just switch yeah? from one tank, from one diesel to the other, and back and forth and back. Yeah? Um, now, also China has discovered this. Yeah, this problem, and they will also make a seeker zone, yeah, such as sulfur, non-sulfur, low sulfur zone, because sulfur is actually the most ingredient which is harmful um, in this uh, heavy fuel oil. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what I wonder, when you showed the graphs with the uh, with the freight uh, cargoes, um, while I was working in a steel company, I had a student job there, the, which built uh, steel plants, mm -hmm. and uh, they built them mainly in India, China, in the U.S., in Germany, all over the world, and uh, because you said there wasn't a crisis in '15. And um, what I can tell that they had huge problems to sell their steel plants because there were a lot of uh, bidders in the in the biddings from from abroad, like China, India, and so. And uh, what I think that we don't just ship uh, goods; we ship also technologies because uh, ch in China it's a it's an honor when you get copied, and they are the copycats as they can be. So. They copy technologies, they build it up, they they sell it, and they uh, they bid on the European market because they can. And um, I think this this forms our societies as well because we, when you when you look at societies like the European ones, then you see that uh, there is uh, a sinking value for crafts. I mean. It's it's not really really exact because there's some like in in, in uh, it's get becomes modern to get to get stuff from from local companies which are handcrafted and so so this is modern but on the other hand side when you see in the building system I mean I'm studying arts and crafts for teaching um, there was a recent development like they put together textile works and technical works to they they put together the lessons for the students and they um, they lowered the amount of hours which they get teached in that. And also in the universities we, we face at the moment the situation that we we are forced to produce uh, like uh, yeah papers. They want papers from us and not crafts. We are I'm studying at the University for Applied Arts. It's weird. And uh, well I think in that way we get really dependent on uh, regions and countries where they produce because they have the crafts. Mm -hmm. And if I can't produce anything, uh, I, th I see or what I sense there is a big, big power shift at the moment. Yeah, indeed. Uh, so um, several industries almost die out, died out in Europe, several industries. Uh, clothing is, uh, there is some renaissance coming, yeah. Uh, it's not only about Moldova, but it's also, um, well, I'm, I'm living here in the seventh district, yeah, so that's the Bobo district, and you have a lot of, a lot of fancy small shops, yeah, where they produce. And actually, if the design allows to produce it cheap, cheaper, yeah, so the designs are very straight. Yeah, so T-shirts are really straight, but I have fancy, fancy fabrics. Of course, you can produce even here. 
Uh, one good example is, uh, without any making any advertisement, is uh, Gebrüder Stitch. Gebrüder Stitch, okay, they went bankruptcy recently, but uh, now they are starting again, yeah, uh, starting over again. But it's actually this concept, yeah, making a jeans, not at Bangladesh, but locally, yes. Of course, you have to afford it. It's not uh, 250 at uh, at kick, but it's about 400 for the custom-made one. Yeah. So the death, yeah, there is, there is, and it's a, a problem is also given. Um, it will not, it will not be forever that China will be the producing the the manufacturing uh, powerhouse because they al already see that they had this one-child policy, so they're getting less and less people. Uh, so they have to also to change and have to rethink their economy. Yeah? Um, so there, there will be changes over the next years, of course. Yeah? Will be changes. And of course, um, when we, for example, look at Germany, as I'm German and I'm looking at German TV, and I see that German industry breaks every record. Yeah? They're now breaking every record they had ever broken. And what they are exporting are not consumer goods, but are machines somewhere in the world to make something something else. Yeah. So yes, it's changing, and it's actually maybe f it's it's actually what we can personally do is a little bit open the eyes more and say, okay, oh, should I really buy this T-shirt, or is it really valuable enough? Yeah. Sometimes if you're buying things. You can say, okay, that's only five euros, but actually, the should, should maybe the value should be about ten, because ten I, I can remember it was some former times it was ten. Yeah, so sometimes the the things are too cheap, cheap here, yeah? because they are just somewhere somewhere drop out of the container. Yeah, and even cheap things you can produce at Europe. If you look, for example, car, the company like uh, Roto, yeah, you can buy these plastic boxes everywhere. That's a Swiss company. Yeah? It sounds a little bit odd. Yeah? Or, um, but they can produce it because it's technology. Yeah? So what we have in the moment, that's actually my, my boss is also very keen on, that's Logistics 4.0. So we are doing more with machines, and maybe machines will do more independently of us. So we do not ha need too much crafted, handcrafted work. Yeah. Yes, it's possible that we get back something back again. Yeah. But and of course, handcrafted things will ever have its value ever. Yeah. So that's uh, that's. But I'm quite sure. Yeah. So this cannot cannot uh, offer the container. Uh, yeah. What uh, one example I got from a former student of mine. He was uh, in the big container business in in Hap uh, Hamburg, and he had a he had a customs warehouse in the vicinity of Hamburg, and he was actually getting containers, and he was a shipping agent at the same time, so warehouse shipping agent combination. So he took containers out of the port of Hamburg, unloaded as his customs warehouse, and there were, for example, tiles for the bath bathroom tiles from China, and what he did is. Oh, I need now some backload for the container. Oh, 400 meters away, there is another tile maker. Yeah. Uh, do you have maybe tiles for China? Yes. So he unloaded tiles from China and reloaded tiles from Germany for China. Yeah. So whenever you want to pay a price, and the Chinese want to have also better tiles than they produce themselves, then there is a market. just produce low quality products it, it's not true yeah 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 of course as of course for example also lego it's well it's only a play a children's play yeah everybody see it looks like yeah it's a children's play i regard lego as high tech because maybe if you look on the containers here on the ship i bought it used uh, so, so in order to get the different paintings and those are the, uh, some of those Legos that are in here. They are maybe from the 70s. Yeah. They're still good in shape, 
So, and they, they are fit perfectly one on each other, yeah? And that, that's high tech, actually. That's high tech, that's not low tech, yeah? So the more, the of course, if they make the precision, and at Lego, the exam, good example is Lego because they produce so far only at Denmark, then some time at Switzerland, at Germany, and then they moved to Czech Republic and Hungary, and the first overseas manufacturing plant was at Mexico, and I don't know, think maybe this year or next year they started China, because their biggest market is A, the US, so not Europe, and the second biggest is China, and growing. The most sold Legos at the moment are Chima series. That's a mixture between Chinese and Lego and uh, Karate, Kung Fu, something, Panda things, yeah? So, uh, yeah, that's a, the most sold series at the moment. Before it was Star Wars, of course, yeah? Everybody was going crazy about Star Wars, yeah? Now it's Chima, yeah? Um, I have, um, well, uh, actually, um, I have a question on the um, uh, ecolo ecological point of view. First of all, uh, Gebrüder Stitch are now producing in Germany because it Austria was too yeah, yeah. was too expensive, so they moved the production to Germany. Uh, the the question is, um, of course, the the price uh, and the f f rates for the for the containers are, are so cheap because energy is so cheap, right? Energy costs nothing because the the, the low grade um, oil product is so so cheap. So I wonder, do you have any figures on the share of um, of um, greenhouse gas emissions that are produced by this global trade, container trade. Um, I, w I would like to know how um, how uh, bad is the effect of my sneakers on the world climate, actually. <laughs> that would be interesting. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, carbon, p carbon countings, yeah. <coughs> um, to be honest, I don't know. And the problem is here, um, it depends heavily on from where to where to ship. And uh, for example, they, there, were, there were studies made by colleagues from the UK where they compared, for example, a full load of apples from New Zealand to the UK with one ship load, A, and B, with a container. The problem here is about the routing. If you have a direct ship load, you just load a ship and you drive to just drive to there, and it's maybe a smaller ship, of course, less efficient, but it's actually less comes along with less CO2, this whole ship load, so very classical way, than having everything put in a container. Because the container will be transported from the sea land first to Singapore, or not to the Indian Sea, but Singapore, and from Singapore then to Felixstow, for example, that's the main port of the UK, and then again by truck. Yeah. So it depends a little bit on the routing. Yeah. Um, but I would, I would say the footprints most of the time are almost negligible because the ship is so efficient in comparison to all others. Such huge ships are so enormous efficient. Yeah. Um, the actual interesting part about it is that both these options are better eco uh, ecologically than buying the apples from a greenhouse in Spain. So it's more ecologically viable to ship them all around the world, effectively, than buying them next door from a greenhouse. So the impact is really tiny. Thanks. Yeah, it's very efficient, right? Uh, but when, I mean, this is then related to certain consumer culture also, and you know, do I need sneakers, five different sneakers in this material coming from here and there? So I think, because as far as I know, and I think it's also going into the example that you brought, this is a huge problem. Like the, the fuel gases that are burned, the carbon dioxide that's burned up. I mean, not on your singular, not on the singular, uh, product, you know, like not on one pair of shoes, but you're not talking about one pair of shoes, you're talking about one 
That's good. By the way, a good point if you say speed. Yeah. Um, there, are, there are many flexibilities, flexibilities for container shipping lines. And one, for example, is the so-called slow steaming. That was uh, used in also these times of 2008. And several times they are starting again doing slow steam. So they are much slower than average speed they had normally. The problem is here that most of the ships are not being made for slow steaming. So most of the ships can slow steam for, I don't know, several hours, maybe 20 hours, and then they have to speed up for four hours. Otherwise, you have the effect you had maybe on your childhood with your small uh, motorbike. Yeah? If you are driving a bad motor oil, yeah, it will not speed up after some times. Yeah? And that's the, the, the same effect they have here. So they slow down, then of course they are doing less consuming, but they have to speed up for a short time in order, in order not to get too rusty. Yeah? So this is, um, yeah, there, there, there are many, 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 uh, many flexibilities inside. Or there was one time they wanted to also to get capacity out of the, of these, um, of the shipping routes. What they made, they didn't uh, took the, uh, the way through Suez Canal, but they took the, uh, the way through Cape Horn in order, well, to get out capacity from the market. If I longer have a longer journey, I have less capacity on the trade, and they made it. They just calculated it, and they made it. And they, they did it because at that time the fuel was cheap. Yeah? So it's uh, there is there is a lot of complex economics going around, yes. Yeah? So and I beg pardon not to cover all of them, but it it's um, to say it short, you cannot calculate it really. And so everybody who says and says, oh yes, you can calculate it, well actually you don't know. It's even if you take a truck, you cannot calculate because you don't know whether the driver is driving good or bad, so fuel efficient or not. So you make an estimation about how much is the average um, consumption liter, and then you make the assumption, you have the kilometers, and then you make it. Yeah? So it's, it's always assumption. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Really, thank you very much. I think this was a very interesting afternoon. Uh, thank you all for coming and for engaging in the conversation. I can only highly recommend to follow Mr. Schramm's research uh, in order to uh, al allow you to get even more into the materials and into, uh, more into the, uh, the, the complexities also of, of the economic calculations and the economic mechanics behind this. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. W the just to make a little announcement in the end, next week we will go to the area of the Nordwestbahnhof uh, on Friday and we will look at the logistical structures of modern container shipping, uh, looking at uh, a freight portal, a container portal that's been built exactly in the 70s, so exactly when all these transformations took place. Thank you very much. <laughs>